Before I speak, I should like to say a few words. <laughs> That's an old cliche that my father used to use. Anyway, uh, most of the stories, and there are thousands of them, <clears throat> about World War II, and they're all from the standpoint of the air crews and the people that were part of it. So I felt it'd be a little bit different tonight <clears throat> if I gave you the viewpoint of the ground crew and saw some of the incidents that we saw <clears throat> and experienced. Uh, a lot of the ground crew jobs were fairly dangerous, and I don't think a lot of people realize just how much danger was involved. And I can cite a few examples, which I probably will here tonight, and uh, <clears throat> uh, let you see it through the eyes of the ground crew. Um, I was stationed at a place called Middleton St. George, and I'll just write that down so that you remember it. And it was the uh, bomber station that was furthest north in England. The RAF was mostly in the south, <coughs> and uh, there's a reason for that, because when Germany first occupied France, <coughs> they were uh, bombing and uh, the, you know, the Battle of Britain and that sort of thing took place. And so most of the RAF airfields were in the south. <coughs> when the United States got involved in the war, then they went into the central part of England. So that left the northern part for the Canadians. So most of the Canadians were in Yorkshire. And if any of you know England, Yorkshire moors were kind of an open space or something like southern Saskatchewan, uh, perfectly flat, not much going on there. And in fact, I don't think it was even good farmland because there was very few people living there, but made a wonderful place to build airports. <coughs> so they uh, put about six bomber stations in there. <coughs> and this was six group bomber command. And they were stationed at um, Linton on Ouse, which was just northeast of York. And Middleton was just above the border in Durham County. <coughs> so we were the furthest north of any of the bomber stations. There were other Air Force stations. Uh, north of that, but that was the furthest north uh, bomber station. <coughs> um, after I got there, one of the first things that they have on uh, Air Force stations is something they call um, a station work party. <coughs> Each section donates a man for a week, and then they do all the little odd jobs around the station. Some of them are dirty jobs, and some of them are interesting jobs. <coughs> and being the new boy in the station there, I hadn't done this before, so I got stuck with the station work party. <coughs> and one of the interesting things that happened there was uh, we went out on parade, and the sergeant came out and he said, I want three volunteers, you, you, and you. <coughs> <laughs> and that was the first you we pointed at, so. <coughs> We had to fall out. He said, go over to the airman's mess, draw rations for 24 hours, and then report to the motor transport section. So we did this. We got to the motor transport section. And they gave us each a rifle and a bayonet. And I thought, wow, well, what kind of a war are we getting into here? <coughs> anyway, little truck sitting outside. OK, into the truck. And this was, uh, well, back on it had the hoops and a canvas cover over it. So one guy got in the front with the driver, and the other two of us got in the back. And our driver was a WAF. That's the Women's Air Force in, in the area. And these girls were good drivers, and they knew their way around. So we started off, and we had the foggiest idea where we were going and what we were supposed to do. So the guy in the front said to her, well, where are we going? She says, you're going out to guard a crash. Guard a crash? 
Yes, he said, one of our Lancasters blew up on a training flight, and we don't want anybody disturbing the wreckage until an investigation committee comes along and tries to uh, determine the cause of the crash. So we figured, well, that's fair enough. And we drove for 20, 30 miles, maybe. And one thing about England, it's an island and there are millions of people on it. But there are some places in England which are totally uninhabited and desolate and deserted, and this was one of them. So we came to this field, and there was this wreckage all over the field. There was a trailer parked on it, and uh, we stopped there. Well, this is the place. And our driver said, okay. She says, I'll, I'll be back to pick you up in 24 hours. So we didn't know what we were supposed to do, whether we were supposed to march around with rifles on our shoulders and this sort of thing. But there was nobody in sight. There wasn't a living thing anywhere, no horses or cows or ducks or geese or birds or anything. And so I thought, well, this job's going to be easy to keep people away. <clears throat> anyway, we started looking at the wreckage. And it was very interesting. This was a 110-span Lancaster bomber that had blown up. And there wasn't one piece of that that you couldn't pick up with one hand. It was total destruction. There was nothing there that you could recognize that came from an airplane. And uh, thought whatever caused this explosion must have been pretty violent. So I thought, well, there's got to be engines. They don't blow up. Engines, propeller, landing gear. Where are they? So there was a bit of a rise about 100 yards away, and we walked over to that, looked over the other side, and sure enough, there was the four engines partially buried in the ground. And <clears throat> we came back, and I picked up a piece of grass, I guess it was, and I didn't know what it was. I picked up other things. The largest piece I could pick was maybe about the size of this table. It was part of the wingtip because it was curved. And I could pick that up. So this is why they were concerned, people taking souvenirs and bits and pieces away before they had a chance to observe uh, and, and make a decision of what uh, had happened here. So it was a real mystery. And I started looking around and I thought, a Lancaster has eight machine guns on it. Where are the guns? So I thought, well, they must have sent gun armorers in there to strip the guns off because they sure didn't want anybody walking away with machine guns. So there were seven members of the crew. What happened to them? And we started looking around, are we going to find bits and pieces of meat and bones and things? <coughs> and uh, there was nothing like that. So they must have sent a medical crew in there to kind of clean up the human remains. But nothing left there would give you any indication that that had been an airplane. Total disintegration. I've never seen anything like it. Anyway, we spent the rest of the day and that night there, and nobody showed up, not a soul. And they came and picked us up the next day. <clears throat> well. Eventually, a work uh, investigation party came out and had a look at this, and they decided <coughs> that the fuel tanks had blown up. <coughs> now, as you use 100 octane fuel out of the tanks, air goes into them. If you don't have air going in, the fuel doesn't come out. You know that from your own aircraft. <coughs> so what do you got in there? 100 octane vapor and air beautiful explosive mixture. So they figured some uh, static electricity spark or a short circuit in one of the circuits must have gone into one of these tanks and when it blew, probably all four tanks went up. There was two inboard and two outboard tanks in, in the wing. So in order to correct this, they introduced a nitrogen system. So as the fuel was used up, instead of air going into the tank, they injected nitrogen into it. Now you've got a mixture of nitrogen and fuel, and uh, 
you're not going to get out of the mass explosion. So that, that took a couple of months to happen. In the meantime, they had me on oxygen charging. So we had uh, a battery of four cylinders, probably about the size of uh, a propane tank that you use in your barbecue, cast steel. And they were all interconnected with pipes. <coughs> and the British used high pressure systems in their oxygen equipment. And this was charged to 2,000 pounds per square inch. Now you've got 2,000 pounds per square inch in that tank. That's a potential bomb if flak hits it or a bullet hits it. So they used to wind them with 16-inch uh, steel wire, just like the threads on a, uh, on a spool of thread, <coughs> and in the hopes that this didn't uh, retard the explosion. And I guess it must have worked because I never saw one that had uh, blown up. <coughs> and they duplicated this system with nitrogen. So they had the oxygen over here and the nitrogen over there. <coughs> and because I had worked on the oxygen system, <coughs> Sergeant called me in one day and he said, we have a leak in the nitrogen system in this aircraft. <coughs> he said, I'd like you to go out and find it and repair it. <coughs> So I grabbed my toolbox and I went out there and uh, there were these six cylinders, two facing me and two behind them and two behind them. And they had about, oh, 10 inch length of copper pipe joining them up. And they put a brass, uh, well, uh, nut really, a uh, specified nut over this uh, copper tube and then had soldered an insert with a flange on it, and then they brought the nut back and screwed it into the cylinder, which caused an airtight joint. <coughs> now, I noticed the solder on one end of this connection was well done, and the other one, there was quite a scarcity of solder. So I put my finger on it, and I could feel the gas coming out. So I thought, well, I found the leak. It's that simple, it's these two tanks right in front of me. All right, so all I have to do is take that piece of pipe off and put another one in. <coughs> well, it wasn't quite as easy as I thought. There were no valves on these tanks, so I couldn't isolate. The whole system was all in one. So the whole system was charged, but the only way I could bleed the pressure off was to loosen one of these connections and wait until the pressure went down. So I started doing this, and, uh, and it started hissing. So I figured, OK, the metric is coming out. <coughs> so I sat back for about five or 10 minutes, and it stopped hissing. So I thought, well, that's it. I guess it's empty. <coughs> so I put my wrench on it, gave it a twist, and bang! You know, the thing blew out of my hand and blew me over backwards. And, and what the heck happened here? And I got thinking, well, as a high pressure gas expands, it requires heat, and it takes that heat from the air. And the air in this part of the country is pretty damp, so it's forming frost. The frost had plugged up the, the nitrogen coming out, so it wasn't really uh, getting all the pressure out of it. So I went back and very carefully put my wrench on there and unscrewed it again until I heard it hissing again. And after about 20 minutes, I finally got the system uh, properly bled off. So I took this section of pipe out. I was going to put another piece in. And I didn't feel so good. I, I felt kind of dizzy and, and weak. And, and then I got thinking. I filled the whole airplane with nitrogen. There's no air left for me to breathe. <laughs> There's a, an escape hatch right above me, so I leaped up and opened that jackknife door in the top of it and took a few deep breaths of air and, <coughs> and went back in and finished the job. Then I went in and talked to the sergeant and I said, the next time you send somebody <laughs> to fix a nitrogen, make sure that he's got lots of fresh air at the cabin, because I just about bought the farm out there. <laughs> Anyway, um, the aircraft that we were flying there were the um, Mark 10 
Lancaster. <coughs> the Mark 10 was built in Canada by Victory Aircraft, uh, both of them in, in uh, Toronto. I think that was on the airport there. <coughs> yeah. And they had the Packard uh, Merlin engines in them and electric uh, system, or the, uh, uh, not electric, but the electronic system and instruments were all American, as opposed to the British Lancaster. And this was quite an advantage to us because the, when the British get something that works, they, they just leave it and they don't improve on it, whereas the Americans have a tendency to do this. So a lot of their equipment was far easier from a standpoint of servicing. <coughs> Uh, okay, we had the first Canadian built Lancaster on our squadron, the 419 squadron. And uh, when an aircraft had finished an operation, then the uh, rigger would make a little bomb on the side. With the fins on it, so on. And every operation would have another bomb. So we went out and looked at this aircraft and uh, the aircraft are designated by squadron and uh, individual letters for the aircraft. Uh, on the side of the aircraft there's the, the round L with the red, white, and blue. And on this side of it there's the squadron markings of year was ours for 419 Squadron. And then there's a letter here that's for the individual aircraft. Well, this one was Z. So Z Zombie was the first Canadian built Lancaster, <coughs> and it had 29 little bombs on it. So that meant it only had one more flight to go to complete a tour. 30 operations was a tour. And then the crews were allowed to fly home. Uh, they'd done their bit for king and country and been over the target 30 times and they figured that was good enough. <coughs> so somebody got the bright idea, why don't we fly Z Zombie back with them and then take a tour all through Canada and show off the airplane and the crew as having done this, this uh, first tour with the first airplane. And they also were going to have a bond selling tour while they went along with it. And at this time, you could buy bonds from the government. And you, at the end of the war, you got your original investment back plus the interest it made. So it was a pretty good investment. So it was a pretty good idea. And we were all quite thrilled to think that Zed Zombie was going to fly back and we were going to be out there and give it a nice send off and everything. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I, I should uh, give you a little drawing here. <coughs> we had one long runway east-west on our station, and another short one going northwest to southeast. This was a permanent station. It was built long before the war and all of the uh, buildings were close together, which was a great idea in those days because you didn't have far to go if you were doing business. <coughs> now, after the war started and they had air raids, they realized this wasn't a good idea because one bomb did an awful lot of damage. So they started having dispersed air drones and they had the aircraft scattered all around the perimeter of the Airport. So we had a perimeter track that went around the whole airport. And this was taxiway for the aircraft and for any service vehicles coming and going. And 419 Squadron was this end of the field, and 428 Squadron was at this end. 
All right. Um, the aircraft took off on their uh, operation, and they always used the long runway. This was about 6,000 feet. Originally, it had been a short one in the, in the early days. So during the night, the wind changed. And it was now going down this way. So the aircraft coming back had to land on the short runway. And uh, Zed Zombie came in. And it landed a little long. It landed about here. Which uh, meant that it ran off the end of the runway and into the grass. And there was a ditch digger left here by people that were digging a drainage ditch. It hit the ditch digger and burst into flame. <laughs> so the fire trucks came out, put the fire out. And by this time, the fire had got back to the central part of the aircraft. And this is where most of the ammunition was stored. And they had two belts going back into the tail turret. <coughs> and the fire reached them as well. So now you've got the fire on this ammunition. The ammunition started cooking off. A bullet started flying all over the place. <laughs> well, no fireman's going to go in there and try and fight a fire with this going. So they just had to stand back and watch it burn. Well, <coughs> I worked in A flight, which was down here. B flight was here, and we had a flight chat here. So I had to pass this on my way to work. So I went in the next morning and looked at it. I have never seen an all metal airplane burn as completely as that. It was nothing but ashes. I didn't think aluminum burned. Now maybe it was a magnesium alloy. There's magnesium in it, that stuff really burns. Anyway, it was kind of a sad ending to a story that could have had a more happy ending. And uh, I presume the crew got sent back to Canada. <laughs> All right. Um, I was doing, oh, I should mention that off the perimeter track we had. Uh, Dispersals. That was a, a taxi strip, and then off those would be a big dispersal. Another one here, and then one here. First. So they were all around the, the perimeter. <coughs> now, I was out in 419 doing uh, a daily inspection. <coughs> certain number of things that we had to go through <coughs> to do that. And uh, the gun, the bomb armorers came up with their tractor and a little dolly, <coughs> a little dolly, a big dolly, with a 4,000 pound bomb on Now that was the biggest bomb that we used. And it was called Blockbuster by some because of, it had that capability. <coughs> uh, we called it a cookie, <coughs> so a two ton cookie. Now, in the bomb bay, which was 30 feet long in a light tester, this would be the front of the aircraft, this is the rear. They would put the two ton bomb here. And this is what it looked like. It didn't have fins on it, it was too big to have fins on it. It just looked like a, two oil drums welded together. And on this end, there were three little multi-bladed propellers. <coughs> now, to guide it down, this end was heavier than this end. So as it fell through the air, these little propellers would rotate around and they extract a firing pin. And if any one of those pins hit the ground, that would go into the detonator and that would blow off the high explosive. <coughs> so, <coughs> being the heaviest and the biggest bomb, it went in first. And either side of that, they had a 500 pound bomb, and it had the, the tail fins on.
Then the rest of the air, aircraft is filled with incendiaries. Now at this time we were going mainly after cities and primarily Berlin because it was getting near the end of the war. We really wanted to get them to do the unconditional surrender thing so they were just pasting Berlin. So this was the bomb load they were using. <coughs> and um, all right, they came with this particular bomb and <coughs> It had two hoisting hooks on it, one on this end, one on this end. <coughs> and I was in the airplane, there isn't that much room in a Lancaster, it's a pretty narrow fuselage. <coughs> and I said to these armorers, well, I'll come back and finish my inspection later if you want to get this bomb on board. <coughs> so they came on with two hydraulic winches. One went to the front and one went to the back. And the top of the bomb bay was the floor of the airplane. So there were little holes in that with a cap on them and they opened those up and they dropped the two the cables from the winches down and hooked onto the, each end of the bomb. <coughs> then they went back into the aircraft. Oh, they had a little trolley with a uh, gas motor on it to pro provide the uh, hydraulic pressure. And they started winding up until they tightened up and, and took the uh, slack out of these two <coughs> cables. And then it was a case of one, two, three, and they both started to lift. <coughs> I hadn't seen this operation before, so I thought I'd stick around and, and watch it. <coughs> so I was standing back about 20 or 30 feet, <coughs> and they had about, oh, probably as high as maybe 12 feet to go. They got this bomb up about eight feet, and the front winch slipped. The whole front end dropped, and this end held. Well, I'm standing 20 feet away, and I, I just was paralyzed. Everything went into slow motion. I saw that bomb dropping just about like that. And the thought that went through my mind was, when that thing hits the ground, my life is over. Well. The edge of the bomb dolly was like this, and the bomb dropped about this way on it, and it put a great big seven inch dent in the skin of that bomb. But it didn't go off because the striker pins had to be. <coughs> anyway, I turned around, and there had been six guys working on that airplane, and there wasn't a soul in sight. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody died for cover. Well, what a good it would have done. Man. This thing would have blown up everything for within a hundred yards. So. <laughs> anyway, um, I decided maybe I'd just uh, go somewhere else and do a few other inspections. <laughs> and it was pretty close. Um, one other thing that we used to have, and it's called a hangar. As the uh, air, aircraft came over the target on a bombing run, the bombardier would be lying in the front, and the, the bomb site was a piece of uh, plate glass about oh, eight inches long and maybe about four inches wide. And it was held steady by a gyroscope. So no matter how the plane was bouncing around, that thing was steady. And there was a little projector almost that projected the radicule onto the bomb site. And it probably looked something like this. So here's your plate of glass. And there would be a line down here, one around here, and a couple more like that. And then this sort of thing. Now, <coughs> When the target appeared here, the bomb aimer would click switches which would arm the bombs. Now just what exactly was involved in that arming, I'm not sure, but I think it made them more susceptible to exploding. <coughs> and then when the target got down to here, he hit the other switches which released the bombs. Occasionally, one bomb wouldn't release. That was what they called a hangar. For some reason or other, it didn't go. Now you've got an armed bomb in your bomb bay, <laughs> and you've got to go home with it. 
Well, they had a few tricks up their sleeve. <clears throat> when they got over the North Sea, they'd open the bomb doors and wiggle the plane around like this to see if they could shake this thing loose. And if that didn't work, they had to close the bomb doors and come on back in. Now they're landing at night in a blackout. You can't run can't have runway lights, they're just little blue lights and you can only see them from 50 feet up. And some of those landings were very good, I would say, because <coughs> they didn't want to shake this thing loose. If they didn't, then they taxied over to their dispersal, opened the bomb doors and shut the engines down. <coughs> the reason they opened the bomb doors is they need the hydraulic pressure of the engines to cooperate them. Otherwise, the bomb armorers would have had to come out the next day and start the engines to open the doors and there'd be a lot of vibration. <laughs> so, the next day, uh, I had to go out and this was one of my airplanes that I was supposed to do a daily inspection on. <laughs> and uh, they put a big sign on the door of the, the aircraft <coughs> And the door on a Lancaster opened inwards and forwards. So they put a sign on it, danger, hang up, do not enter. <clears throat> and when I got to the airplane, somebody had left the door open. Of course, I didn't see the sign because it was inside. So in I went. <clears throat> I went up to the front. I'm doing my duty inspection, bouncing around inside the room. <clears throat> The radio operator from the crew came in, and he had problems with his radio set, so he climbed in. <coughs> There's the two of us in there, one guy at the, <coughs> at the radio and me up with the instruments. <coughs> and the uh, sergeant fitter came out of the hangar, out of the uh, flight jack, and he was madder than a wet hen. <coughs> and, and this uh, radio operator was uh, a commissioned officer. <coughs> Anyway, the sergeant came in. Get the hell out of there! There's a hang-up in there! <laughs> we came out of there like corks out of a champagne bottle. On the <laughs> <laughs> and then he started on me. Didn't you see the sign? What are you doing in there? I said, there was a sign. The door was open. So he went marching out to find out who left the door open. <laughs> in the meantime, I disappeared. So that was another close one we had. <laughs> Um, one day, I had finished my... Uh, Excuse me, Eric, how old were you when all this was going on? You said what? Me. How old were you when you were there doing all this? Nineteen. Nineteen? <laughs> um, I was working here, and I was riding my bicycle back, and I got to about here. And I noticed the Lancaster on the approach for the short runway. And it was in a F, F Freddy, for the Great Squadron. That's the guys from down here. So, because I had to cross the runway, I was going to wait till he landed. When he got to here, if he was in 428 Squadron, then he would have to turn to the right. And if he was going back to the maintenance hangar, then it would have been in here someplace. <coughs> um, what they had done was bring a replacement aircraft in, and when we got them, they didn't have things like radar and some of the guns and uh, uh, this kind of equipment, so they would put them on. That would take a couple of weeks, and then they would take them over on a test flight. So I presume this is what was happening, because our aircraft flew at night. This was in the, in the afternoon. All right, I watched him landing. And he touched down about here. And I thought, he's not going to have very much room to get stopped by the end of that runway. And he must have thought the same thing at the same time, because he fired all the throttles and the engines pulled last took off again. Well, it got up about 50 feet and lost poor power on all four engines. All four went together. Now, whether it was the mixture too lean and the sudden rush of fuel in them, 
or what it was, I don't know. It was finger trouble of some kind, probably. Anyway, they came down again. This time, <laughs> they landed here. Well, there was no <coughs> way he was going to get stopped before he did. So I was watching and I thought, something very interesting is going to happen here. <laughs> <laughs> so he went off the paved runway, on through the grass, across a deep drainage ditch, and then here was a field. And there was a hedge here and here. It went through the hedge here and through the hedge here. British hedges have been around for 100 years, and they aren't just little twigs like that. They have big, strong branches. <laughs> filled with rocks. When he hit this, <laughs> it weakened the landing gear. And when he hit this, it tore it right back. The airplane landed on its belly, and the props dug into the ground. <clears throat> and I was the closest one to it. So I dashed over as fast as I could. <clears throat> to see if anybody was hurt, needed an ambulance or anything. And <laughs> so I was able to ride my bike about this far, and then I got out, and I had to go through the hedge and run across this field and through that hedge. And by the time I got to the airplane, <clears throat> the crew was just coming out. And they weren't saying very much. <clears throat> so I said, anybody hurt? Any, anybody injured? <laughs> the pilot came out and he cut his lip where he put his head into the instrument panel, but he was the only captain. <coughs> and from the rear of the cockpit, or the cabin, to the tail gunner is a long plywood runway so you can get into the tail turret. <coughs> so the tail wheel had been shoved up again, well, I guess when it hit edges had been knocked up through the uh, bottom of the aircraft into this and instead of being like that it was like this <coughs> so we had a little different how to get the tail gun right <coughs> but um, <coughs> then the uh, the crash trucks and, and so on started to arrive well they couldn't get at it from here because they couldn't drive through the edges so they had to go all the way around and up another year. And uh, some of the brass were uh, coming along to ask some embarrassing questions of the crew. This was a brand new Lancaster, never been flown, complete right off. $100,000 airplane is down there. I think one of the most thrilling sights that I saw the whole time was when our aircraft took off on an operation. Now, we had um, two squadrons, and there's a letter of the alphabet for every aircraft. So theoretically, you've got 26 aircraft in a, in a squadron. <coughs> um, we never had that many. Some were in getting an inspection, some were in getting damage repair, some had gone missing. So between the two squadrons, we might put up 34, 35 Lancasters. <clears throat> now, a takeoff, um, well, let's, let's put it this way. The, the whole thing was organized at, <clears throat> in headquarters in, in London. Sir Arthur Harris, uh, Marshal, Fuel, uh, Air Marshal Sir Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, they called him. He arranged, organized all of these flights and exactly where they were going, what the target was going to be, and so on. And if he called for a maximum effort, that meant that we put up every aircraft that was serviced, not only on our station, but on all of the stations in six group of the Canadian RCAF. And the RAF did the same in theirs. So this would have been one of their thousand plane raids. So the takeoff time was very important because once the aircraft had taken off, they headed out over the North Sea to a place they called the IP, initial point. And when they got there, they changed direction and went towards the target. 
Uh, you couldn't have a thousand planes all meeting at the same place at the, at the same time. So the first bunch would go and the second bunch would come along and they'd form the bomber stream that went over. <coughs> so we had to have all the aircraft ready to go exactly on time. And they came from uh, <coughs> 419 Squadron around here and they lined up on the permanent track all the way around here. And for it to work, they lined up on the other track. Of it. And here we had a trailer with a controller. This guy had an oldest lamp, which would shoot any color. So when the aircraft got here, and they, we had them ready about a half an hour before it came out time, and the crews got out and they were walking around because they were going to be in those airplanes for eight hours. And I looked at those guys, and they were not happy campers, believe me. They were going into hell in a few hours. And uh, they weren't speaking very much. Nobody was laughing or joking. <coughs> and I thought to myself, maybe I'm lucky that I didn't make here. Or I might not be here talking to you today. Anyway, when it came time to go, they got in and they started the engines. <coughs> so the controller here would give a green light to this guy. He'd move into position, set the brakes, full throttle, right up. Four Merlin engines, 1,200 horsepower, full throttle. And that was just vibrating right through you. You could feel it. Then all of a sudden, they let it go, and he'd be off. As soon as he was in the air, green light for this guy, he came in. He went. Now, we were getting them off about a minute and a half, two minutes. 36 aircraft are going to take over an hour to make that takeoff. So, no matter how, we couldn't get in any faster than that because we had to wait for what was in the air before we set the next one. When they got in the air, then of course they were circling the field and they were flying tail over like this because flying on under full power. And you look up and see 36 Lancasters in the sky over your field of the sky, which is black with them. I mean, that to me was one of the most thrilling sights that I have ever seen. We will never see it again. Four engine prop driven bombers taken. And uh, we all had to be down here if we were on duty. Just in case it was a last minute snag of some kind, we had to be in there and fix it if we could. <coughs> so, I always remembered that. And then, <coughs> it was one time we had a rather unusual set of circumstances because this end of the, the field was kind of swampy. And right about here, there was a flock of birds, about 50 of them. They were a good sized bird, I don't know what they were. So, the first airplane to take off, these birds got up, they flew in a big circle right around like that, and come back. <laughs> the second airplane went, the birds all took off. <laughs> so little the rascals, they would not get out of the way for every airplane that went up. Now, you don't want a bird strike when you're taking off with a load of bombs and a load of gas. <laughs> Believe me. But they didn't hit it. And speaking of that kind of an incident, we had a, a satellite drone, which is about 20 miles away. And uh, they were doing a takeoff in a full bomb mode. And just as the aircraft got ready to rotate for takeoff, the right landing gear failed. So the wing went down onto the runway. And at 100 miles an hour, it was just red hot. And then she caught fire. And the aircraft, without that landing gear, did a ground movement in the center of the field. Well, no fire engine is going to go out and try and put a fire out with an aircraft full of bombs and gas. <laughs> the crew got out as fast as they could. They ran like hell. So they just had to wait. And she blew. I was 20 miles away when I heard that explosion. 
4,000 pounder and two 500 pound bombs. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty bad. Um, the weather in Britain was quite unpredictable and quite changeable. Um, as one of the BBC announcers said, <coughs> summer came on a Wednesday last year. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when aircraft came back from a raid, sometimes their field was sucked in and they couldn't land. So they'd phone around and find out another field that was open and they'd divert those aircraft to that field. But we got word one day that an American squadron was diverting from their field and was going to land on ours. Well, they bombed in the daylight, we bombed at night. So they were coming back in the afternoon. So we all went out to watch it. I think there was about 50 B-17 Flying Fortresses and about a dozen B-24 Liberators. So there was quite a bunch of them. And we had to put them up for the night and feed them. And I don't know where they stayed. They weren't in my barracks. <coughs> anyway, uh, the next day, their field was clear. So they were going to take off and fly home. So we went out to watch them. And uh, the B-17s took off first. And about five of them took off. And then the sixth one couldn't get his number one engine started. This is the port outer. And he tried, he tried. I don't know whether the starter or the, uh, <coughs> flooded the engine or what. Anyway, he told his crew to get out. So they all got out. And he took off on three engines. Now you got <laughs> two engines on the starboard side going full throttle, and one on the port side, the inner one, going full throttle. When he lifted off the ground, guess what happened? <laughs> started turning. Well, he turned about a year and went down. And our bomb thumb was right here. <laughs> and he was right heading straight for it. And he was only about 10 feet tall. Um, boy, we were standing there just on tender, not knowing what to do. <coughs> He went over that and he disappeared down the other side. And we were waiting to hear a bang and see a sheet of flame go up. And we didn't hear anything. We couldn't see anything. Five minutes later, he comes flying over the field at a thousand feet, all four engines going. So he, he used the windmill effect to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and then picked up his crew and took off for home. <laughs> so the next little while, there was quite a bit of conversation about this crazy yank that darn near blew up our air. <laughs> um, anything to get home, maybe. <laughs> There's another thing that's given me cause to, to think about from time to time, and <clears throat> I'll, I'll just explain what happened. Um, B-Flight 419 had an aircraft um, VRPP and the number of bombs on the side of PP was only about three of them. So it was a relatively new airplane. And uh, only been on three uh, operations. So <coughs> Um, it took off on an operation, it didn't come back, we lost the airplane and the crew. So we ordered a replacement for it. A few days later we got another PP. It went three or four operations and went missing with the whole crew. So we got a replacement for that. <coughs> Third one went missing. We got a fourth one. But this time, the crew that was assigned flatly refused to fly the Peter. That thing is jinxed. We are not going to fly. We'll fly any other airplane in the squadron, but not the Peter. So 
Well, the quadrant leader was uh, wondering about this. He thought, oh, well, we'll just switch the crews around a little bit. We'll put those guys in one of the other ones. But the other crew was going to fly at PP. The old crew was going to fly at PP. So he didn't know quite how to handle this. So finally, he came up with a brilliant solution. 419 Squadron will, will no longer have a PP here. Just wiped it off. So that particular aircraft disappeared. I don't know what they did with it. And the one that replaced it was King Queenie. Well, they didn't have any trouble getting a, a crew for that. Queen, Q Queenie always came back. No problem. So four in a row we lost. Over here on A flight, I had one of the aircraft that I used to look at, J. Johnny. They had 92 bombs on the side of it. It had gone over three tours and come back at every one. And it was in bad shape. I mean, the cowlings were all bent and scratched from me and taken off so often. The paint was peeling off it. The thing looked like a wreck. I stood and looked at it one day and I said, when are these days that thing's not going to come back. It's not going to be flapper night fighters. It's just going to die of old age. <laughs> <laughs> but J. Johnny went through the whole war and even flew back to Canada. So why do we get one going all that distance and this one four in a row just bang bang? Is there some kind of a pattern that's going on in life that changes things, you know, a, a predetermined thing. Think of the things that have happened in your life, some factor that's changed the course of it. It's happened to me a couple of times. Anyway, I've often thought about that. Um, incidentally, there is a website on Middleton St. George, uh, if you want to look it up. And it's mainly the history of it, uh, how it got its name, and, and, the, and so forth and so on. <coughs> anyway, uh, it's there, and uh, if you take, like to take a look at it, um, it's up to you. Well, uh, I think I've shot my boat. Uh, thank you for listening to me, and I hope you found it interesting. Is the airfield somewhere? It's now a Teesside International Airport. It's a commercial airport. Yeah. I'm sure there's lots of people have questions, Eric. So okay. anybody got a question? Question for Eric? I'm sure lots of people. Well, have questions. How, how long were you there? Um, from November the 10th, 1944, to April the 25th, 1945. So just the last few months before the end of the war. So we were we were using the we were bombing cities, and uh, there was some problem about this because the Americans were bombing in daylight, and they were bombing um, strategic targets, you know, specific factories or something like that. Whereas we were doing carpet bombing in the, in the cities. And Hart Harris was criticized severely for, you know, just bombing civilians. Of course, they did it to us, they started it. And he came back with the theory that, okay, you bomb a factory, in six weeks, the Germans will have it running again, producing. You kill a worker, but I can't replace him for 20 years. So that was his theory. <clears throat> and of course, they were putting a great deal of pressure on, on Hitler for un unconditional surrender. We get near the end of the war, and, and we were getting closer and closer all the time. In fact, there was one or two times when we were all ready for operations, and they scrubbed it at the last minute because our troops had captured the, ta the target. Hmm. That uh, aircraft that uh, blew up the bombs in the middle of the field, collapsed the gear, you said you were 20 miles away when it went off? Yeah, it, 
Where was it? No, you you were 20 miles away? Yeah, I was in Middleton, St. George, and, and there were our satellite room was a place called Croft, Croft Spa. So were you reassigned there? There was a, a newspaper clipping hanging up in the uh, Aerospace Museum uh, about that particular incident, and I didn't notice the the uh, newspaper that it was taken from, or the date on it, but I would place it about February of 1945. It's getting close to the end of the war. Uh, I didn't see it, at, I wasn't there, and I didn't see what, what it looked like after the explosion. <laughs> did, not much left. did it destroy the airfield? Um, I don't think so. It was pretty well out in the in the grass area there, so a lot of it was dispersed. It was a definitely um, a dispersed air drone, mostly Nissen huts, or Nissen like once buildings, and uh, they spread them all over the place. So the, the blast wouldn't be that effective on that. And that, uh, that was what they did with most of the uh, fields they built during the war. What, what was your specialty? I was an instrument mechanic, and uh, when I first uh, tried to decide on a trade, and this fellow was telling me that he was an instrument mechanic, and he tried to explain it, and I said, well, fine, you take out one instrument, put another one back, no big deal. Well, he says there's a little more to it than that. He says there's what happens on the, on the uh, instrument panel, and there's something else that happens on the engine. It could be one or the other. And not only did we do instruments, we did oxygen equipment because there was too little uh, instruments on the instrument panel for pressure and rate of flow of oxygen. So all of the oxygen equipment we looked at, it, masks and the installation and even the charging, which I was assigned to for a while. And uh, we also looked after autopilots gun sites, bomb sites, cameras. Yeah, it was a, a good technical education we got out of Well, you, you said that uh, uh, if you had made the air crew, or you didn't make the air crew, so how did that work after you enlisted? Uh, tell us, you know, how you end up as an instrument uh, person. Um, well, when they told me that I didn't qualify for air crew. And why was that? I said, oh. you had to have 20-20 vision uncorrected to make here. And I passed everything up to that point. And all my life, I wanted to be a pilot. This was when I, I decided when I was a kid, I was going to be a pilot, come hell, blood, or high water, and how I was going to get the training and so on, I didn't know. But of course, when the war came along, they would train you. <laughs> They would supply the gas, they would supply the airplanes, and they also paid you, so it looks like a pretty good way to go. <coughs> anyway, um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh yeah, they took me aside and said, I'm sorry, you don't qualify for air. Now, do you have a particular trade that you have to trade for? Well, I didn't have a plan B. I was devastated. I was just stunned that I, I hadn't made that. So I went home and told my parents that I failed the air crew exam. And they didn't seem to be too worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we got talking about the trade training. And my aunt was a physiotherapist, and she happened to be there at the time. And she said, well, she says, I have an airman for a patient right now, and uh, uh, he's coming in tomorrow into the office. Why don't you come down and have a talk with him while he's flying over the sun now? So I thought this was a good idea. And I went down, and he was a permanent force man. He'd been in the Air Force for years before the war. And he was a sergeant. I didn't realize at the time that on the ground crew, a sergeant uh, has a fair bit of authority. <coughs> And he was an instrument mechanic, so he started telling me all about that. And he, he gave me a lot of good advice. He said, when you go down to join up, 
He says, they may be short of a certain trait. He said, they will try their best to get you to take that, even if it isn't what you want. He says, you don't have to take that. He says, you can wait till you go through your basic training, and then you go before a trade board, and they will decide. And that's exactly what happened. Because I went down the next day to the, to the recruiting depot, and they were short of wireless mechanics. And they tried to talk me into that. And I said, no, I think I have one instrument. Well, you'll have to wait till you get through your basic training and go before a trade board. Even then, you might not get it. I said, well, I'll take that chance. But. <coughs> so I went down to Toronto, went through my family and uh, basic training. I went before the trade board. I thought there'd be a half a dozen guys there with all different trades telling me about it. But no, it was just me and an officer in his office. And he said, is there any particular trade that you think you'd like to take uh, training in? I said, yes, I'm, I'm interested in instruments. So he looked over his paper. Boy, I says, we got a course starting in three weeks. We can do So it was that simple. You know, the, the various degrees of circumstance and chance and, and openings at the right time and the right place kind of guide your life. Sort of like PP. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? You may not do daily inspection. How many guys in the daily inspection with you? Sorry, I have a little You're doing a daily about. inspection. You're doing a daily inspection. How many guys? Do well, it with you? Be a team, or you all by yourself? Oh, all by myself. Operated? Yeah, yeah. You went on the airplane, and later on the engine guys came. Yeah, and uh, in bomber command, ground crew were strictly non-operational. We never flew, and because if you did go up, and the airplane went missing, then you were classed as AWL as a deserter. You lost all your reestablishment credits. Your family got nothing, and you got a dishonorable discharge. Now, transport command is a little different story. I went on with that after bomber command ceased to exist. If you worked on the inspection in transport command, you had to go up on the test flight. <laughs> this is sure that you did a good job. As you <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a, a bit of a scare one day because <clears throat> we we were flying B twenty four so. Liberator bomber, we converted into transports. <coughs> and uh, the spark plugs hadn't come in for the fitters. Everything else was up to date, everybody had done the work, but those plugs hadn't been changed for 300 hours in this particular aircraft. And I think they're supposed to be changed about every hundred. I'm not sure. Anyway, we had to go up on that test flight. It wasn't our fault the plugs weren't changed. And uh, it so happened everything ran fine, but we were a little twitchy about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I got all kinds of flights in that because I had to go up and uh, they had the Minneapolis Honeywell C1 autopilot, which was a beautiful thing. It was an electric autopilot. And they, they had the three switches so you could operate either the ailerons, the rudder, or the elevators, or any combination of the three your hands with the other one. So it was beautiful. And then there was another unit down in the nose in the Bob Amers compartment. It's called the stabilizer unit. I'm not sure for what, why they did that. But the Americans were using the Norden bombsite. Nobody ever saw a Norden bombsite except the bombardier. The security on those was top secret. They kept them in a vault. The bombardier went in <coughs> They took that thing out, it was in a canvas bag, it was on a chain, and they padlocked it up, and they handcuffed it on his wrist. He went out to the airplane, he got the thing out, and put it on the stabilizer gun. Nobody else in his crew saw a Norton bombsite. <clears throat> Over the target, he was making adjustments on the Norton site, and that would make adjustments in the autopilot. So over the target, the bombardier was flying the airplane on the autopilot. The pilot just sitting there with his arms full. <coughs> they claimed that that Norton site could drop a, uh, a bomb into a pickle barrel from 12,000 feet. 
<coughs> how accurate it was, I guess. No. <coughs> anyway, uh, after the pump goes off, there's nothing left of the pickle barrels. <laughs> 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 it's like horseshoes, close is pretty good. <laughs> Maybe you could draw the billion. Uh, 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 Any more questions? Um, Eric, were there other uh, makes of aircraft at uh, Middleton and St. George, like Halifax's or any other? Was there any other aircraft there, or were there just the Lancasters? Um, they went through several stages. They originally started with the Wellingtons, and then they switched to the Mark III Halifax, and then they updated to the Lancaster, because it had the bigger bomb bay. It carried a far bigger load than the, the Mark III Halifax. Yeah. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you very, very much. Uh, well, that's the end of another meeting. So everybody will see you at Tim Hortons. And uh, see you next month. Try not to uh, waste time. I get angry for your class.